Hey guys, welcome back. It is Matt Chat episode 513. Thank you very much with Mr. Frank Sifoldi. Uh, now Frank, uh, this name might his name uh, might ring some bells if you uh, were on Gama Sutra. Uh, that's where the first run of my Dungeons and Desktops articles came out. They were originally articles before they uh, made their way into book form. Uh, Frank was the editor over there at Gama Sutra at the time, or one of the editors, uh, but he's done a lot of other great things, especially about video game preservation, uh, collections, archives, <laughs> preserving information, the games, uh, the ROMs, the instructions, the even the advertisements, you know, <laughs> all the ephemera. <laughs> uh, so he's got a lot of very interesting stories, as you will soon see. Uh, anyway, I was really happy to have him on the show. We had a great conversation. We talked about everything from piracy to <laughs> video games collecting to counterfeits. <laughs> Lots of stuff about unreleased games you're going to find really fascinating. Uh, anyway, we got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Frank Cifaldi. How you doing, Frank? Good, man. It's uh, uh, good to finally get this together. Sorry about last time. Oh, well, the good things are worth waiting for. <laughs> You got a maniac mansion. Now, what did I, I saw? Sometimes you say it's a uh, secret of Monkey Island. Sometimes it's Grim Fandango. Do you have a favorite? Is it? Um, I'd say Secret of Monkey Island. Um, yeah, of, of the adventure games. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just feel like he really well. They they really nailed the design. Um, of what makes a good adventure game in that one. Has it been done better since? Sure, but you know, like. Citizen Kane's been done better since too. You know what I mean? Like it's it's like the game that I think set the tone, um, and for me that makes it always really special. Um, but my Maniac poster here—that's uh, that's something that was sold um, through the uh, Lucasfilm catalog when the game came out in in '87, uh, um, and I got it signed by the entire uh, dev team of three people. <laughs> so uh, David Fox, Ron Gilbert, and uh, Gary Winnick signed that. That's great stuff. Yeah, that's a good, uh, maybe a good place to start our little chat here. Because we're thinking here about adventure games, graphical adventure games, one of my favorite genres, obviously mm -hmm. one of your favorite genres. Maybe not a genre that seems to have held on as well as some of the other genres, you know. Commercially, anyway. Commercially. Right, yeah. There's always talk about, I mean, you go back to the night. Well, Ron Gilbert was writing that. Why adventure games suck? Piece, you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever that was. <laughs> it's like this. The, the, the mo yeah. Um. So sorry. Uh. I, I had a little video cut out there, so I missed uh the last maybe like twenty seconds of what you're saying. <laughs> so no, twenty so, seconds. Apo <laughs> apologies to uh to your viewers. Um. And this happens to me once per call. It's really the weirdest oh. thing. So this will not happen again. But. Uh, where I left off was you were pointing out that Ron Gilbert wrote uh, that editorial for, uh, I believe, the, the Journal of Computer Game Design uh, called Why Adventure Games Suck. He laid it all out. I believe that yeah. was 1989 that he wrote that. And then I missed everything you said after that. It's probably taking a good look at Sierra. Well, I was just thinking of, you know, since we'll be talking so much about video game preservation and yeah. genres and lost games and, you know, just because something may not have held on or been considered as commercially viable. Uh, still well worth preserving. They still have important lessons to uh, teach modern designers. And, you know, I figured you'd have more to say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's there's there's an easy argument still just preserving even that stuff. Like even if that type of game design is, doesn't currently resonate, it did inspire current game design. Um, so, um, you know, the, the so it's really important in any historical uh study to well, i mean the whole point of history right is to understand where we came from right um and so um i think it's really really easy to justify um putting resources into preserving um graphical adventure game history because um i i think that the ideas that were introduced in those games um you know had undeniable influence on on the trajectory of narrative based games um leading into today i don't think you have i don't know i was just playing spider-man 2 i don't think you have spider-man 2 without a graphical adventure game um somewhere in there interesting take yeah there's a lot we could uh, do with this topic I, maybe just come back to the poster though because one of the things i think we strongly 
Well, there's a couple issues around this uh, this topic. So one is when we talk about preserving video games, we we want to do so much more than just preserve the the ROMs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, play the games. Uh, but I, you know, you run into people and they say, "Well, that the other stuff isn't as important, right? The boxes, the manuals. You know, the, wh- why bother with that stuff?" Yeah, um, the original media, of course. Like in all those, all the sort of surrounding, you know, ephemeral things around games. Um, I mean, you know, you're basically asking why does the Video Game History Foundation exist? Because um, exactly. we're, you know, we're we're not focused. I'm a strong on... supporter of. It. I hope I didn't sound critical of it. I mean, I'm... oh no, 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 no. Of course. Um, yeah. Um, so we're big believers in um in the idea that when it comes to the study of video games that um gameplay is an incredibly important part of that like being able to understand how a game played and access it and play it but uh we we think that um that's largely a solved problem for most of video game history um in that uh you know, historians know where, I mean, to use your terminology, we know where the ROMs are. We, we know how to find that stuff. Maybe it's not a good permanent solution, but currently it is a solved thing. Um, what we think is missing um, is the context around these games. So, you know, you you were asking about things like the the, the packaging art and, and the instruction manuals and things like that around the games. Um, for us, you don't, we, we don't believe you you can properly put a game in its time and place without that context um you know really easy example that i like to give is just super mario brothers just the game on the nes um you know you you can give that to a child right now and uh they will probably intuitively understand it because the the sort of language of games essentially evolved from that one um and so you know like you i think kids have enough literacy literacy to understand how to make mario move and jump and then they'll go from there but and they'll probably have fun even right like they might have fun playing the game if they can get past um you know the antiquated visuals of it but um all they're going to get out of it is this is a fun game right they might get a little bit of, of context based on their own you know, personal history, having played maybe later Mario games, like, oh, this was maybe the introduction of the fire flower or whatever, right? But what they're not understanding, just playing a game in a vacuum, um, is like, who made this game, right? Like, why they made it, who it was even sold to, like, did it do well? Did people like it at its time? Um, But even just things like, um, you know, oral history of people playing it in its time, which is a little bit rare for this one, but, um, but just like understanding things like the sky was blue and that was kind of new, you know, like, like, cause most of the games at that time were like black backgrounds, right? Mm. Uh, the, the idea that before then, for the most part, and I'm not saying there weren't exceptions for the most part, games were, kind of following the rules of traditional games and that in that like uh your goal was a score right like super mario brothers i think informed um the way that we tend to play at least you know single player offline things now which is like no we are achieving a goal right like we're we're not we're not like a, we're not trying to drive a number up we're trying to like in this case beat the game right like like see the end of the game rescue the princess and then the game's over. Um, you know, like these are things you don't understand by just having a game ROM. You need the context around it. And and once you have that, um, you understand Super Mario Brothers' place in history um, in the same way that, I mean, I think I already mentioned Citizen Kane, so I'll do it twice this show. Um, in the same way that, you know, Citizen Kane, if you just watch it, um, as I did the first time, just as a movie, it's like, that's an entertaining movie. You know, like Orson Welles and his and his theater troupe are really good at drama and humor and and you know making an entertaining work. But um, you know, you go to disc two on the DVD set or whatever, and you learn who who William Randolph Hearst was. You know, and 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 you kind of learn the context of also who Orson Welles was at this time and how he was this 
golden boy who was like given this crazy contract to do whatever he wanted with this movie and and how what he wanted was this like takedown of this rich media mogul right and and like you start understanding the parody aspects of of citizen kane and 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 who this jerk was in reality like it just makes that movie so much more interesting and and i want that for video games and i and i don't i don't feel satisfied with uh the amount of that that we have um which is why i started the foundation i mean i totally agree i have a good colleague good friend of mine film scholar and you know we have discussions and he's always telling me how hard it is to get people to take film history seriously yeah I'm like really? Well, you should do <laughs> video games. Well, it's, yeah, exactly. It's, 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 that's funny because yeah, if I go to Barnes and Noble so right now, there's obvious. like there's like an entire floor to ceiling bookshelf of like film study right now in a like major retailer chain. Yeah. You go to the video game section, there's like an art book and like a recipe book for World of Warcraft food, you know, and like that's the video game section. So like I I do not sympathize with your colleague. <laughs> I'll have to, have to let, let him uh, uh, let him know that. But yeah, with the Super Mario Brothers, always when I'm teaching students about that game, and we, we talk first, of course, about the, the Atari and the, the arcades, and I think that kind of ties into what you were saying with the, that arcade experience where you're plugging in a quarter and playing for a couple minutes trying to get a score on it <laughs> right. uh, versus the console experience. And, and there's a lot of, uh, I think there's just so much, thinking about innovations and technology and the fusions uh, with that one game where you, it sort of opens up the Pandora's box of <laughs> video game history. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I really think that's, I don't know, that's like the action comics number one of, of games, you know, it's like, yeah, there were games before that, but this is the one that like started what we think of as video games. I've often compared it to the steamboat Willie. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Or people that know it, that well, people probably know it. You could Google a Steamboat Willie. <laughs> Public domain soon. <laughs> January first, I think, right? Something like that. Yeah, there is. A, I saw some stuff you had written about Super Mario Brothers, and I guess there's some confusion or some debate about the release date. <laughs> I don't. So, it, yeah, there's there's a whole thing there, and I can go even deeper than what I wrote, but. Um, you know, this was years ago. I wrote an article. Um, really, my goal was to demonstrate the fragility of video game history. And the way that I illustrated that was um, I can't substantiate the release date for the most important video game of all time. You know, like like that that was the goal of that piece. Um, and uh and I mean, it, it seems like you read it, but like essentially, you know, there is a stated release date by Nintendo of America that um, the game was first sold in the United States on October 18th of 1985. Um, I want to be clear. We know the Japanese release date, which predates that. We know the world debut of Super Mario Brothers. We don't know when it hit America, um, but there is a stated release date. Um, that stated release date is the stated release date of the Nintendo Entertainment System. Um, and so I was trying to substantiate, like, well, where did that date come from? You know, like, what was there any press around this? Was, were there any eyewitnesses to this event? And, and um, you know, if, if you if you read that article, which is on, uh, it's archived on gamedeveloper.com, formerly Gama Sutra, where I used to, where I was working at the time. Yeah, we worked um, together back then. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> then you know it, it was a journey and there's really not a piece of paper that anyone can point me to you know that that substantiates this claim and, and in fact i have a lot of reasons to doubt it um based on contemporary material from that time um my favorite thing from that story is that um i don't remember which day it fell on october 18th 85 like tuesday or something um is this the and one? uh yeah that's the one yeah um I think it fell on a Tuesday, that release date of uh, October 18th, 1985. And I was talking to Gail Tilden. Gail was one of three Nintendo employees who um, went to FAO Schwartz, the toy store on release day and like watched the first system go through the register. Um, there were three of them. And I've talked to two of the three. 
Um, the, the third one, unfortunately is, is, is unable to speak, uh, for medical reasons, but, um, but, uh, she was like, well, it's impossible that it was a Tuesday. <laughs> and I was like, why? And she's like, well, I remember we watched the sale go through and then we all went out and got a cocktail and I've never had a cocktail, uh, on a weekday. <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I just love that story, but like. I mean, you know, I was trying to substantiate the first Nintendo to be on sale. And like, I've actually dug a little deeper and not published anything since then, because uh, I had someone reach out to me saying, I think I bought the first NES. I was a kid, Epico Schwartz, 85. And the person at the register said something like, oh, congratulations, you're the first one to buy one of these. And I was trying to substantiate his story and uh, ended up going very, very deep down the rabbit hole of uh i'm gonna i'm gonna give a fun little game history anecdote so i think your viewers are probably familiar with the video game crash uh they're they're familiar at least with the concept of like you know the nes was the thing that sort of turned everything around right and um and they're probably aware maybe not i'll fill them in that the 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 nes was test marketed only in new york city uh for christmas of 85 um the store that like was their main account was FAO Schwartz, which is still around the famous toy store in, in New York. Um, there was one guy who ran the sort of electronics department and decided what to carry. Um, he was the guy who decided, okay, we're going to carry this thing. We're going to take a chance on the NES. And in fact, the salesman was like, we'll buy back any unsold products. So it wasn't much of a risk. Uh, that guy, Joe Quesada, famous comic book artist, became the editor in chief of Marvel Comics for a while. <laughs> he was just coincidentally the guy who first sold the Nintendo. But uh, yeah, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because it's it's kind of endless. But uh, um, people just don't get the there was the a fragility time. of it. There was a yeah. time when you could seriously make an argument that video games were just a fad. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Chris students are like, no way. <laughs> yeah but the yeah you you miss all that if you don't know the you need the context sure. right exactly you need the context to understand why that game's important yeah let's see well coming back to video game preservation i remember i guess it's probably been a couple of weeks or maybe even months uh, since the you know, since this article came out about the dearth or, or how much stuff is missing mm. uh, from video game history uh, I think 87% was the. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I really love that we got that number. It's just 80. alarming, you know, that yeah. something so big, so important, so massive, you know, so I don't know how anybody could argue that it's not culturally significant. You know, one of the great. Yeah. I don't think anyone argues that, you yeah. know, like. So how come you think we would be just obsessive about <laughs> archiving and uh, protecting things and storing them away? Well, we're, you know, when, when we're talking about that 87% number, we're talking about, yeah, a study conducted by the Video Game History Foundation um, that was uh, attempting to demonstrate, you know, approximately how much of video game history is no longer um, commercially available, right? Um, and the number we came up with was 87% um, of historical video games are just completely out of print. Um when I say historical, just, you know, there's the, you go read the study, please. But um, games made uh, published before 2010, like was our kind of, kind of cutoff. 87% of those you cannot get um, unless you, you know, buy the antique media on eBay, et cetera, or you pirate them. Those are your only options. Um, and so, um, you know, we're kind of talking about, like I said, the, the commercial availability aspect of games and, um, if you're kind of asking like, you know, how did we get here? Um, it's a little bit complicated, but, uh, the short answer is that video game systems, you know, devices that play video games, like platforms, you know, computers, arcade cabinets, et cetera, they're, they're all very kind of discreet and unique from each other. Um, and so continuing to support software written for one, um on to the next one you know that that costs money and and not only does it cost money back in the 
older, older days, it didn't really make sense. Like if you wrote a game, I mean, we were just talking about the NES. If you wrote a game for the NES, um, you basically designed it and programmed it, et cetera, to only run on the NES. You know, it's, it's not like you could take that same game logic and put it on the Sega or whatever without like significant work. Um, and so for most of video game history, um, that the sort of source code, that raw material, like all that stuff wasn't well kept um, because there wasn't a reason to, you know, like once you've wrapped up a project on the 8-bit Nintendo, you might, you might keep your floppy disks around for a few years in case you need to like make a revision for, for a later run of the cartridge or something, right? Like fix a bug for like a reprint, right? But other than that, you had no real reason to keep that source because you couldn't do anything with it. Um, and so we lost a lot of historical source. Um, it is the exact same thing that happened to film, right? Like in the earliest days of film, um, we lost, we've, we've already lost something like 90% of, of American movies made before, I think 1929. There's a fa really famous film foundation stat, right? Uh, that those movies are just gone forever. And it's the same situation where it's like, well, we made a movie, we made prints of the movie, we sold those prints to theaters, we can't do anything else with this now. You know, like the idea of holding onto the master is like, well, why? <laughs> you know, like, what am I going to do with this master other than spend money like holding this can in storage, right? This extremely flammable, you know, like nitrate film, or, you know, that the, the, the can burn this entire institution down. Like, why would I hold onto this? I'm not going to, you know, theaters don't rerun movies. Um, there's no such thing as home video or like streaming. There's not even television yet. <laughs> you know, we can't even sell broadcast rights. So there's no reason to hold on to this. And I, I think same thing happened with video games. Um, but the other thing that happened because, because there was no reason to look forward to reprinting games is that the rights are kind of all over the place um, for old games. And, you know, even talking to like, a major old company that was around in the old days and still around trying to like navigate the legalities of licensing one of their retro titles. Like a lot of times they're just like, look, we literally don't know who owns this piece of the game, you know, <laughs> like, or, you know, if you're lucky, you'll dig up a contract and it's like this individual, according to our contract owns the music we can't locate them and here's how much it would cost our attorneys to like start digging into this. So like it, it there's, there's a lot of things working against the idea of reprinting these older games. And, and, you know, unfortunately it's just, we weren't in a reality for a long time where remastering republished games makes sense. I think we are now, um, but you know, it took a really long time to get there. So that's why a lot of these old things are out of print and basically, um, you know, you, you have to go, you have to find other ways to, to access them if you're going to play. Yeah, certainly some of the bigger hits, some of the games that people will, are familiar with still, you know, but you might be able to find those in a retro package, you know, remake, but uh, there's so many, you know, I've had a lot of developers on legacy classic, you know, game developers, and even they, you know, like, yeah, I would love to remake my game or put it out there, but I don't know who has the rights and it's right. These big companies, you know, they'll buy these portfolios from defunct companies and they don't know. <laughs> yeah, they don't even know they own it. Where you know? it and again, it would cost money to even do the uh, exploratory work to prove to them that they own it, you know. And by the time you've done that, like, you know, your profit margins going down, you know, piece by piece as you're doing that work. And old games don't sell that much. They're not worth that much money, you know, unless they're huge hits. So it's it's just a really unfortunate cycle i'm pretty sure i've actually had developers ask me if i could send them the roms <laughs> oh i've definitely had that yeah game. yeah like well i guess that's probably legal uh -huh. <laughs> I, I really doubt it but yeah <laughs> unless they're the copyright holder yeah i remember when i was first uh you know i was doing my research for dungeons and desktops and that, that series you know i'd be trying to get the game because i don't feel like it's enough just to read about a game no you know i i have to play it in some fashion and so i'd be off on these uh so-called abandoned wear sites sometimes it'd be the only place to be hosting these and you know i always felt like well i guess i'm breaking the law 
<laughs> but how else, you know, even if I wanted to buy this game, uh, which was the case, you know, I'd be happy to, you know, buy it if it was available. Right. So just, just not available. Uh, so what, what can you do as a historian, you know, in that case? I mean, what, what's, what are the ethics? I, I, I mean, I don't know how much my, my, uh, my ethics like crosses over with United States copyright law. Like I don't care personally, you know, um, I don't, I don't care that I'm robbing pennies from like oil barons, you know what I mean? Like it's, um, that's me personally, like that, that's just speaking as me. Um, you know, I, I've often said, and it's true that like, I don't think any history happens without bending some rule, you know, like um, I think it's this sort of not very well kept, but a little bit well kept secret that in historical study, like there's some law you have to break to get the work done. Um, and so I don't know, like I, I, I think ethics has to be a personal discussion with yourself. You know, and 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 we all have different ethics. Um, I think mine leans toward, you know, I'm not going to let copyright law prevent me from doing my job. Um, but, uh, you know, it's but the thing is, we we don't have a choice in many cases. Um, you yeah, know, especially if I teach the game studies class and I want students to play this game and it's right. not commercially available, I mean, what? You can hope that it's embedded on the Internet Archive, right? Like you can hope you can hope the Internet Archive has a playable version. And then Which they like, often do. Often. Right. And then it's out of your hands. And it's like, y'all figure out the legalities of this, not <laughs> me. Um, which, yeah, which is great. And it's a really tremendous resource. Right. But um, but other than that, you know, you're you're either, like I said, sort of like buying antiques off eBay Um if the game is even like available, right. And a lot of old computer games are just not, um, you yep. know, or, you know, there's cases where games were never on physical media. So there is literally no, I mean, Nintendo just shut down the eShop, right. For the 3DS and the Wii and the Wii U and, um, anything that was never put on physical media that was only on the eShop. There is no even theoretical legal path toward those. If you didn't already buy them. Um, and so, you know, like your literal only option is, well, I guess you could try to find a console that has these installed, right. <laughs> uh, or it's piracy and there's just no other way to access these games. And, and, uh, you know, frankly, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. I've ran into the problem several times. Even if I buy for the role-playing book, you know, I might buy a, a used copy of this role-playing game from not not even that old maybe early 2000s 90s just cannot get it to run on a my computer nope. yeah and i finally end up having to get a rom anyway <laughs> well you might end up having to get like a crack even yeah, right if it's like a computer I, game i got to crack the game that i you know you i guess bought, that you purchased legally yeah yeah that you know that whole thing about you know, this might be a bit of a segue or a side thing but to me the copy the copy protection movement you know, and all the uh, all the efforts to keep people from pirating. You know, I totally get it why the publishers were interested in that, but you know, I don't know how effective it was even at the time. And <laughs> I, I feel like now it's just made life really difficult for people like us trying to go back. And now you got this, you know, this weird copy protection scheme that's <laughs> right. <laughs> your your virus protection software kicks in and like <laughs> well some of them have to like call home to servers you know to even get permission to start oh, that, yeah know? what do you do in that case I yeah mean, i mean you know luckily we're in an age where there's still enough interest in getting games to run that like you can still for the most part locate workarounds on the internet but you know that's that's scary because i don't I don't believe the internet as we know it now is going to survive as it is for much longer. You know what I mean? Like the, the idea of independent searchable internet um, is, is I think dwindling. And so um, I think we're going to pine for today's internet, you know, in, in like 10 years. And, and, and I worry about things like, like finding cracks, you know, like, cause right now that, 
at least for me, maybe there's a repository I don't know about that's awesome. But at least for me, it's it's still like I Google till I find it, you know, and it's often like in a forums post, right? Like when's the last time anyone was on a forum, you know, like the like it's it's actually really scary to me. Yeah. Well, what do you uh, what is what's the solution? Is there something we can do to? <laughs> I don't, I don't have the solutions to everything. Um, but you know, I, I think, um, I think one of the best sort of long-term bets we have right now is the internet archive. Like, you know, any, any, anything that you don't want to be lost, make sure it's on there. Um, I wish we had literally anything else, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the internet archive is, is kind of like the only hope we have for, for, um, archiving the internet essentially um and so you know i don't know i don't have i don't have a grand solution for everything um no institution including ours is ever going to have the resources to tackle every problem but um you know i i have always said that i think video game preservation is an ecosystem i think that if people want to get involved they need to sort of figure out what they're interested in and good at and therefore could be the most effective at and um I can see projects coming together from interested parties where it's like, we need to build the master database of like how to make any game run, you know? Um, and we need to like maintain that in some publicly accessible way. Like I'm totally spitballing here, Matt, but like, that's for that's me, so that, that's, that, that, that to me is the only like maybe long-term solution. But even then I, I don't really have an answer for like, well, where does, who hosts that? Who funds it? Right? Like, does it need funding? It's like it's it's a really tough problem. I mean, I've seen cases where fans of a game, basically the community, will get together. They'll make this game work on a modern system, put together a website, and maybe even have some mods and get some activity developed uh, around that. But then a publisher will emerge. You know, now that they see, oh, there's still some commercial. You know, clearly there's still some commercial interest in this since it's got all this. Uh, you know, this this fan community around and they'll rush in you know with the cease and desist and <laughs> try, yep. to, try to take that over so yeah i have a hard time sympathizing you know with those folks uh you know i don't know <laughs> <laughs> again you can sort of see their their point of view but yeah it sure makes it difficult for people that are just trying to uh, preserve games yeah yeah for sure and and I don't know. It's uh you're not making any money off of it. You know, like these fans, they they did all this work for free just because right. they love the game. And it's not like they're charging now if they were charging money for it, you know, they I would have less uh usually when that happens, I'm like, oh, they must be working on something, <laughs> you know, because like they they're not gonna like because mm-hmm. cease and desist cost money, you know what I mean? And 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 typically a, a corporation is not going to bother spending that money unless they can identify a very direct A to B line where this costs us money if we don't do something, you know? And so I think a lot of times they'll cease and desist, you know, um, I think in many, many cases, they're very stupid. Um, you probably had to deal with more than your fair share of stuff like that. From I never have. Never have? No never. No one's ever bothered me. Um, no, no one's ever bothered me. I'm encouraged to hear that. That makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> no, I've been putting like, you know, unreleased game ROMs on the, uh, you know what? I take it back. Um, one time um, in like literally like 2000, like 23 years ago, <laughs> I had a, I had a website, um, you know, on like tripod or angel fire or something where um, I was helping to distribute new ROM dumps as they happened. Um, cause that's just how things were at the time. And, um, I remember that I put up, someone had just digitized like a bootleg copy of the first super Mario brothers. Um, and, uh, and it had some weird funky hacks to it. Um, like you could swim in the castles or something. Um, and that was just one of the many games I put online and, and, um, I did get a, an email at the time from some law firm that represented Nintendo that just looked for ROM sites. And it was, you know, the ask was, we need you to take down anything that mentions Mario or Donkey Kong. Like, okay. <laughs> um, that was the only thing I've ever gotten. And, yeah. and, you know, I've, I've put in, I've put a lot of things on the internet since then, but I think, you know, for me, that was a lesson learned where it's like, I, 
so the foundation, one of, one of our unique strengths, and, and I think this, you know, is an extension of where I came from, you know, like, you know, I started this thing, right. So like, this is something I learned that I kind of imparted in, into my nonprofits ethos is that is operating less on by the books, um, uh, copyright adherence and more on common sense. Um, so might we piss off Nintendo if we put up something involving Mario or Donkey Kong, uh, that they might sell, you know? Yeah, probably. Right. We don't do anything like that. Um, if I put out the source code for a midway arcade game from 1996, it never even shipped that was canceled before it was sold. Am I going to piss anyone off? Probably not. Um, you know, so we, 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 we've done a really good job of operating on, on common sense and have never gotten in anything close to legal trouble because of it. I remember when I was writing my, my book, there was a point where the publisher was asking me about the screenshots mm -hmm. I'd taken of hundreds of, <laughs> of games. And they, they said, I need to track down the, uh, the copyright holders of every one of those games and get their explicit permission. Was your reply just LOL? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, I kept saying there's just, you know, I was trying to explain it the best I could. I'm not a lawyer you know, yeah. by any means, but I'm like, there is, surely there's, um, yeah, how is this not fair use? Yeah, <laughs> fair use would, would, would apply here. And so they finally relented on that. But yeah, there was a point where I was like, maybe I, you know, could you do a book, whole book about video games? And I mean, video. <laughs> right. Without <laughs> the video part. Yeah. The... <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I mean, why would you, how does that improve society? They even have a, you know, law like that, it, you know, assuming that was even, you know. Oh, I mean, all it, our laws. Our laws are the reason fair. why fair use is in there for just for cases like. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think also not a lawyer let's be clear um and and but i think um you know I, I, that that sort of common sense line i think is i don't know maybe part of our secret sauce even you know we 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 want there to be more industry participation in the preservation of games and um you know i'm i'm fortunate in that i had a career in the industry and so you know i i have some decent connections and things like that. And there's some level of trust between, you know, a lot of industry players and, and myself in this organization and, and, you know, just operating on a level of like engaging in interesting people without pissing them off has, has done really well for us. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give an example that I think some people who don't do this sort of thing might think would be scary, which is that, we recovered a version of, of SimCity, um, which is, you know, a really, really famous, influential, important game um, for the 8-bit NES, which never came out. It's This is something that um, was actually developed internally at Nintendo. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a first party Nintendo game. It was an NES version of SimCity. They shelved it and did it just for the Super NES, which was like right on the horizon. I think they just kind of moved it over there. Mm -hmm. um, but we recovered a copy. Um, and we did this really cool like breakdown and analysis of it. And, and we straight up put the ROM on the internet and no one said anything because like common sense line, right? It's like, well, Nintendo's not going to sell this thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> They're not going to suddenly like dig up this unfinished prototype, you know, from like 30 years ago um, and start selling it. Mm -hmm. um, also, I heard from... Uh, the the uh sim city team at the time because sim city is still a franchise and they were really happy um i had a meeting with ea where they're like hey we want to know more about how to preserve sim city history you know like 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 it was a positive thing for everybody yeah. so like the idea of putting a rom on the internet isn't always like oh you're going to jail you know the nintendo ninjas are going to come it's like like no just common sense dude like are they going to sell it no then they probably don't care you know, they don't have time for this. Yeah, I haven't got a chance to play that. Is it is it a good uh, port? Um, it is uh for the system, it's remarkable. Um, it's not done. It's it is like you know, we actually we actually um a volunteer for us reverse engineered it and really broke down the code and stuff. It's really obvious 
Um, I'm sure you've had guests who can explain things like that. You probably know enough game development to understand that like this was a build meant for like a trade show, right? This is going to be out at CES. So um, under the hood, it's kind of a disaster um, because they didn't need to optimize things and make it clean yet. You know, it just had to present well for someone playing for like 20 minutes. So um, a lot of it's there. It's really um, impressive for what's there. Um, I really like it as a relic of what I think is a really interesting moment in history, which is that um, Nintendo licensed this game from Maxis and they flew Will Wright out, the, the SimCity guy, mm -hmm. uh, to Kyoto. And apparently there was like a week long sort of design session with like him and Miyamoto uh, to figure out how do we make SimCity into a Nintendo game. And so I love NES SimCity as like a vision of like the ideas that came from that get together of two famous Eastern and Western game designers, like their collab, you know, was this game ultimately resulted in super Nintendo SimCity, but there's ideas in the 8-bit version that didn't make the transition over. So it's almost like, um, yeah, that's it right there. It's almost like by viewing this 8-bit version, you're getting closer to like the pure sort of vision, uh, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, Wright and Miyamoto had together. Um, yeah, it was all history. You got to scroll quite a bit till you see the NES one. Um, all right, play this. But that's them. That's them together at Nintendo. You know, like they collaborated on this. I like to have all this archive somewhere. Their conversations. Oh my god! Yeah, like meeting notes and stuff like that. Huh. Pretty cool. Yeah, there's so much stuff I don't know. Studying this <laughs> all these years. All these. That's years. true of all of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was its one appearance. Was at CES '91. You saw the video down there, but um. But yeah, I mean, yeah, just point being that like, you know, that uh, you just operate in on common sense. And, and you know, I, I think, yeah, I think a lot of people think that suing people is way easier than it is. <laughs> yeah. Like the reality is, no, that costs a lot of money and you really need to like be threatening a company's bottom line before it gets that far. And one of the examples I came across, well, not suing, but uh. Now, there's a game called Auto Duel. Uh, I'm going to look it based up. Based on Steve, Steve Jackson games, I think they had a game called Car Wars or something like this. Now, there's an old Apple II game. I got blanking on the oh, name. It's an of origin it. game. Okay. Yeah. Now, but I was trying to get get uh, play that game because it's <clears throat> arguably at least fairly important in terms of role playing game history. Uh huh. And uh, it's just having, I was having such a hard time finding the you know the ROMs for that. And when I got, I dug a little deeper, I found that Steve Jackson Games was really going after people that are trying to host this ROM. They they are one of the most litigious companies. Well, their right? argument was they just didn't like the game. <laughs> it was old, buggy, and crappy game, and they just wanted to forget it ever existed, you know? <laughs> it's just like, well, I don't, that's, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I'm not going to, you know, not write about it. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you can buy it for a dollar now. Oh, well, things probably have changed. That's <laughs> one of the things that's so amazing to me. Just it hasn't been that long. I guess when I was when I was working on those articles with you, mm -hmm. uh, how hard it was back then. There was no good old games, or if, if there if it existed at all, it was in a very you know, yeah. hard stage. <laughs> like, yeah, like yeah, you yeah. guys are so so lucky. You don't know how <laughs> lucky you are. It's so easy to get this stuff up and running. You know, yeah. even on, on a modern system, I mean, they're doing a, you know, some fantastic work. Yeah, you know, that's, we're in an age where you can theoretically run almost anything, but there's still this sort of like barrier to entry mm -hmm. of just knowing, you know, where the clean ROM sets are, um, how to configure an emulator, stuff like that. It's, um, you know, the emulators are really tricky, especially for oh, console. You know, that's tricky enough, I suppose, but. You know, especially when you start to get into obscure computers. Well, even just like Commodore 64, right, like for the most part, yeah, you Commodore have to 64. know how to like type to load a program and stuff like that. And it's, you know, it's it's still really difficult to access a lot of these things. Yeah, what does this load? Quotation marks? Right. Yeah. 
And also, how is that mapped to my keyboard? Because this is not a com- this is not a Commodore sixty four keyboard. It's mapped a little differently. Yeah, yeah that brings really up a question I was wanting to, to ask you about. So, how important do you think it is for somebody, and especially somebody younger who wasn't there? You know, if if they want to play, I'll say Super Mario Brothers or any sort of old game. Uh, does it how big of a difference does it make if it's they're playing it on the original hardware? or the original controllers and so on versus, you know, just trying to get by with a modern controller and maybe a keyboard. Um, Personally, does that hurt you inside when you (laughs) absolutely not? It's the opposite. Um, No, I, I do not. I am not a big believer in you need to hold the original controller to understand this game. I do not like I, I play most of my classic games with an Xbox one wireless controller, just straight up. Um, Yeah, me too. So, um, no, I don't believe in that. I, I, I think there are situations where you do need original hardware just for accuracy reasons, but that is not true for most old things. Like if you play Super Mario Brothers on your emulator of choice, you are 98% there. Um, and that is enough to understand the game. Like to me, the, the idea of like, you must hold the original controller, you must play on a real CRT over composite. It's like, you know, that, that to me is like is saying, what's that? I mean, where does it end? You know, this quest. Well, that's the thing, right? It's like, okay. Does, ultimate does, authenticity. Right. <laughs> right. Does, does your mom have to be like baking cookies in the next room? <laughs> does it have to be Christmas? You know, like, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it would be like arguing that streaming a classic film. Oh, you're not watching that film because you don't have a newsreel and like a cartoon before the thing and there's not like an organ player and a curtain you know like it's just it, it's it's endless and um and it's you know i think even worse than that um i kind of get this like gatekeeper vibe from it too where it's like people who maintain this antique hardware and i'm one of them like i straight up like, i have a garage full of this crap like i, I keep my old hardware but um but there's this sort of notion, I think, among a lot of those retro hardware enthusiasts that like, oh, you're not playing it for real if you don't play it my way. And I did it. You can do it, too. And and, and I don't like that gatekeeping aspect to classic video games. I think it has uh, created a world where most people who are interested in this stuff look like you and me, Matt. You know, like we're just like old white dudes and yeah. like like we and we want to keep it difficult to access these things. And and. It's kind um, of an elite, almost an elitist kind of attitude. That's how I feel, you know. Like, and 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 I'm not saying I'm not even pointing out anyone specific here, but I, I think I think there is this danger of that when when we start talking about authenticity and and you know, well, yeah, like, um, do you really want to play this on the original Commodore 64? You you remember having to load games and how long it? You remember the disc swapping? Uh, oh yeah, I play it on my Mister, <laughs> which is a fantastic piece of open source hardware and. For the Commodore game, someone has made a uh, like a set of like images that know how to auto load themselves with the correct settings and stuff. Like, why would I want anything other than that? You know, I I go to a menu and I hit play and the game starts. Like, that's I don't need to sit down and and, and also the other thing too about authenticity with old video games is we don't play games the way we did anymore. You know. Um, great example i like to come up with for um ways that commercial products have done things to my mind correctly um uh you know i I worked at digital clubs for a while did some classic game collections but um one of our contemporaries at the time um m2 in japan um they did a re-release of a sega master system rpg that i love um called fantasy star um they, they made fantasy star work on the switch and it's you know, if you don't do any of the settings, it's basically the original game, but um, they have toggleable things in there where you can increase the walk speed, you can decrease the, the random encounter rate, you can increase the amount of experience and gold you get from those random encounters. So like you can change things to where like the grinding of Fantasy Star is reduced significantly. Um, it also auto maps the first person dungeon sections. Um, it doesn't just give you the map, but as you're walking around, it draws in the map because it's not the eighties anymore. We don't bring out the graph paper when we're playing video games. And, and so 
my, my only point there is that like they did a really fantastic job of getting rid of the old cruft but giving you the core experience and as a fantasy star fan you have my seal of approval everyone to play that version and turn all the options like up to 11 and it's the same game i promise you uh that you know i played you know in in ancient times like graphing it out um and uh, uh where i'm getting with that is that like you know that's another aspect where like authenticity comes in it's like well like you're pretending that it's the eighties at some point, you know, yeah. and that's just not how anyone absorbs content anymore. We, we don't live in a world where like, you know, here's your one game for the next three months. <laughs> you know, uh, That's just not reality. And so I think that by pursuing complete authenticity, when it comes to playing these old games, um, you're almost killing them you're making them unobtainable um as an experience and i just don't believe in that well even somebody like me i grew up like you doing the graph paper and all those all those things for those i remember playing i was playing pool of radiance <clears throat> and i came across that uh gold box companion <laughs> i don't know if you're familiar with that uh but it adds a lot of things like the auto mapping and and, and all of this jazz and i think I, I i as soon as i saw that i'm like i'm never going to play this game again without this right <laughs> why would you you know yeah uh you know i guess i could see maybe some value and just maybe one time just to see what it was like you know with graph paper or something but yeah i, I think there is value would not right? insist like, on that. but that is not something that like i would ever argue for any games like oh it's necessary to understand this game is to like right now somebody wants to you know they can right, right. Yeah. yeah you're not forced to play right you know, I like the way they did the Monkey Island uh, uh, remake where you could switch back and forth between the old and... I like that in theory. I like that kind of approach, you know. <laughs> I do like that approach. The one thing I don't like about that make release... Make an option, in... right, and turn it off and turn well, it off. The, Yeah, but oh, the one uh, thing I don't like about that right. release it's specifically, though, is that um, the original Monkey Island, as, as made by its creators, um, was a 16-color EGA game. Mm -hmm. Um and a different art team took that 16 color art and painted over it to give it more colors. The secret of monkey Island special edition where you can switch back and forth does not contain the original art. Um, so it's like, I don't know. It's like, like colorizing, all the, colorizing an old black and white class. It is exactly like colorizing. An old black, like I love the VGA art and that is sort of become the canonical art, but like, you cannot switch back to the original in any way. In fact, the original has been out of print since 1990. Um, do, do you know why they did that? I think, I th well, okay. My assumption, um, and this is something that, you know, I kind of learned at Digital Eclipse, is that video game historian is not a game development thing. You know what I mean? Like, like, like the idea of having like someone who's really good at understanding video game history, that's not something you learn at DigiPen. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you don't like, it's not a game development skill to understand history. Um, and so I suspect they just didn't have anyone on the team who knew the difference. You know, I think there might've been, I, I'm just completely guessing here. And I've, you know, I've met people who worked on the game, but like my, my assumption is just like, no one knew that that uh, like, Oh, those are the original graphics. You know, I, I, it's really easy to just look at the graphics and be like, Oh, that's just like the downported version. You know what I mean? And, and my hunch is that no one even thought to include the EGA version. Cause that's the inferior one. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I think it was an innocent uh, mistake, um, but I think it is a mistake to re-release that game and not give people access to the original. It's like, Fox. yeah you're switching back and forth between remake you're switching back and forth between remake and remake you know what i mean like like which flavor of remake do you want um i played it on the amiga computer back in the day well that's the worst one <laughs> <laughs> not worse worse but like that one is like this weird mutant between ega and vga um and what they did was they took the 256 color vga graphics and just ran them through whatever they had at the time to crunch it down to 32 colors so you get like kind of gross smeary dithering and stuff like that it's like you know I, amiga fans are very upset with me right now because that's the one they grew up with but like, <laughs> that's, the, know, 
<laughs> but what? no, that that is like watching a movie on like a like a third generation VHS tape and being like, well, that's what I grew up with. It had it had, you know, it had video static on it. So that's what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> just the tracking control. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like during that one scene, the tracking goes out of whack. That's what the game. That's what the movie's supposed to be. <laughs> Screw well, your 4K remaster. You know, it kind of raises a side point, I guess, about, you know, just thinking about the these ports of games and. And, you know, is that worth preserving all these different ports? Oh, sure, of course, absolutely. Port Games parties, games, right? and, you know, like the history of like history of uh, history of porting a game is game history, right? Yeah, I think even with SimCity, like I'm pretty sure that came out on the six Commodore sixty four. It did. Um, that that's a really nobody interesting remembers story that. Itself. One. It doesn't well, look nearly as nice as the well, it, and it plays awfully. But I think that's a really interesting release because that's that is the original. Um, that is what Will Wright created first was that Commodore version. It was not released. They went and uh, you know made the Amiga and Mac versions. I think were like the primary releases when the game debuted. And then I think they just literally like took his old Commodore prototype and published it as the Commodore version of SimCity. So it's actually missing a lot of the features that are in the Mac and Amiga, like the debut versions, like it. And it's it's really interesting to go back to it um, because it's like, oh, this was the original vision. And, um, you know, it's very will right that there's not a lot of gaminess in it. Like it's just a simulator, you know, like there are, you, you know, in SimCity, like there's like scenarios where it's like, you know, there's going to be an earthquake. Can you like turn the town around? Right. Like there's sort of like game scenarios. Uh, there weren't any in the Commodore version. So the instruction manual that comes with it instructs you <laughs> to like, to like mess with the town manually and then try to rebuild it. And that's like the, the, the game is something you have to read the instructions and then like, you know, like do yourself. <laughs> like, otherwise it's just a simulator. That's a fascinating case. It I'm really is. People don't know that about SimCity. Yeah, the student was really like, I want to learn about SimCity. I'm thinking, would I send them to the Commodore 64 version? Absolutely not. No, <laughs> uh, I would say the Macintosh one, uh, yeah. which is on the Internet Archive. So I'd say play the original Macintosh version. Well, that's a, another thing we kind of talked about a little bit. Well, actually, I don't know if we've touched on this, uh, but I sent there's, there's kind of a tension uh, between video game archiving and okay. preserving uh, versus people that are just interested in collecting. Mm. having big private collections and they're of course they're getting on you see fantastic prices on ebay you know you're always reading about somebody just spent you know five or six grand on this <laughs> you know because i hate to see that because i'm like well that means i'll never own you know, a copy i'll never have it in my little archive here yeah you know so i mean i guess it's uh, i don't know how i feel about it really i don't want to say well people shouldn't be collecting things and uh, you can't fight the times what, what you are know? you but, but yeah, I don't, I don't know where that what the question is, but like the answer is you can't, you can't you you can't say, fight the tides. Like I, I mean, know you say you should donate this to. Not well, to I mean, okay, a mass talk... collection. Maybe they should make that available publicly somehow, or well, let's let, let... like you come in to archive some of it. Right. I mean, let, let's talk about the sort of idea of a ripped. First of all, like I, I, I don't waste my time wishing games weren't worth money. You know what I mean? Like. I think a lot of people in the sort of video game archiving world um, just want to believe that like things are going to turn around and it's going to be the nineties again. And we're going to go to thrift stores and find video. Like that's just never going to happen again. They are collectible forever. Deal with it. Right. Like work around it. Um, you know what I mean? Work with the system. Don't spend the rest of your life just being mad at it. Right. Um, and so for me, I I have for most of my game preservation career acknowledged the fact that collectors exist and games are worth money. Um, and um, I think that one of my strengths was recognizing this and, and figuring out how to work with game collectors on their level. Um, this goes back to like, 
you know, 2003, like I, well, really 2002, like I was, I was really starting to like archive unreleased video games, which at the time were the most expensive games you could get. Like the market shifted really now the high ticket number things are like, you know, a never opened copy of a famous game, right? Like that's kind of the, the best you can do is like, you know, Super Mario Brothers is probably worth a million dollars if you get a first print, right? But, um, but back then, like an unreleased game, like, oh, that's worth like a thousand dollars. It's so funny now. Um, and uh, I actually got a lot of unreleased games on the internet by dealing directly with collectors. Um, by, you know, instead of fighting them and like, trying to like preserve this world where like collectors don't understand that there are unreleased prototype games that they can have. You know what I mean? Like, like that, like that's the feeling that I got from others. But for me, it was like, no, these are the guys who are actually like doing the legwork and finding these things and putting them in their collections. Like that's the pool. Like, how do we get in the pool? Um, and so, you know, in, in my earliest days, like 20 plus years ago, um, I was working out deals with collectors and it was like, okay, you like having physical things. I like putting ROMs on the internet. Like how do we, how do we make these things work together? Right. And, and so, you know, one of the earliest things I did was I acquired a lot of prototype video games and um, I would be like, Hey collector, I have these. I know you like owning these. I just want the files from your games. You know, so like, let's kind of do a, a trade and, and like, you know, in those days, especially like I actually managed to sort of break even, you know, like <laughs> it would be like, I will give you these things I paid for, um, you know, in, in exchange for these ROMs. And I don't know, like working with within the collector's world is something that I, I really believe in because I just don't fight reality. Um, and so, the, yeah, let me know. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, I mean you know your question was about sort of like should there should there be something in between should like people have access to private collectors most museums of like history come from private collections exactly that is how the world works never met a collector that would, would say i don't want you to see my stuff i mean it's usually like, oh my god you're interested in this stuff? usually people yeah. no, usually oh people are collecting because they have museums in their houses you know what i mean and and um, uh, if it's important for video games to be in a museum setting, which sure, um, these private collectors are the donors of tomorrow, you know, or if they're not the donors, they are at least the holders of the items until they until they find their final home. You know what I mean? Like, it, no, not all of them. You know, not every collector is like that. But like in the museum world, that's where stuff comes from. You know, they, they come from private collections even if they have to pay big bucks for them, that is the source for where these things tend to come from. So collectors actually play a really important role, I think, um, in the preservation of video games. I, I mean, you know, the idea of even knowing what games exist, I think that starts with collectors, right? Like that's where that, that kind of set the tone for, I mean, in my earliest days where I'm like, okay, what NES games aren't on the internet yet? Cause I'm a little ROM dumper kid, you know, like, the list of games came from the collector world. And it's like, ah, that one's not online yet. I'm going to go find that one. Um, so where it gets tricky for me is where I started, unreleased games. Um, a game that never came out um, that might exist on like one physical piece of media in the world. Um, in the collector's world, that can be worth a lot of money. And if someone has copied that game data off of that object, that object is now worth significantly less money. Um, and that is just the truth as much as people might want to argue against it. It is literally true. Um, and so that's kind of an, an iffy place for me where, um, you know, I don't like that actual historical one of a kind relics sometimes are in the hands of people who, you know, collect them from a place of love and are caretaking for them the way that they know how, but um, don't necessarily have like an archival background to know how to truly care for this thing and to make sure that it is actually preserved for the future. Um, and so, you know, I, I've continued my work to try to like 
work within that sphere and, and figure out how to, 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 uh, to help within that world. And, and, you know, there's a lot of games that are on the internet now that are just from me, like having good relationships with collectors, frankly, that, that, you know, understand that there's something more important sometimes than them owning something, you know? <laughs> um, and yeah, there's a lot of work that I've done to preserve games that, that has been by understanding that collectors are preserving games in their own way, you know, by, by understanding that they're humans with interests that I can like, you know, become friends with. That's really and, kind of milling this over my head. So it'd be like, if I had this unreleased game. Yeah. I have an example on my desk. The only right one now. that had it. I have an example on my desk right now. Here's our example. This is, <laughs> this is Beethoven's second for the Sega Genesis. Um, this is based on the movie Beethoven's oh. second, not oh. on the, the composer. The dog. <laughs> it's the dog. Um, this is a Sega Genesis game that was never released. Um, and okay, you were mulling it over in your head, right? So let's pretend I have already digitized this. This is fine. But let's pretend I haven't yet, right? right. Let's yeah. pretend this is the only example only. in the world. It's on these two chips. That's the, the data, right? Right now, I could put this on auction and it's worth, you know, thousands, plural, of dollars because it's not dumped is, is the term, right? Like, like the data is not online. Um, as soon as that data is online, it's worth, you know, I don't want to make a guess because we don't have enough sales data to like find a real trend. But, you know, I could see this going for like, eight, 10 grand on a really, really good day in a really good environment. If it's undumped, if it's dumped, it might go like one, you know, like that. And that's significant. It's yeah. it, like, it is actually a significant decrease. Um, and so, you know, the, the ways that I try to combat that are, um, well, first of all, getting to it before anyone else does, <laughs> as I did in this case. Um, but, um, you know, there's other ways of doing it. Like I am currently, as we record this, privately fundraising for one unreleased game that is on auction right now. Um, and uh, by making it a group effort, no one is out a significant amount of money. Like all of us are just kind of chipping in for the idea of, of preserving this thing. And then that's, you know, that's a way of sort of working within the collector system, you know, like, like acknowledging like, okay, no matter what, this thing's worth a lot of money on the collector's market. Um, we could either like plug our ears and pretend like it's not, or we can just acknowledge that and be like, okay, if we're going to save this, where does money come from? Like wh wh where, where, how do we find money? And, and, um, and that's, you know, how I've operated for most of my career is just not, uh, is acknowledging reality and working with them. Like the best, I think you have the healthiest attitude you could possibly have. I think so. Yeah. I also wish they weren't worth money, guys. Like I'm... <laughs> oh, people, people are getting ripped off left and right too, buying these what they think is a legitimate, you know, copy of something, and then find out as a counterfeit. Oh yeah, that does happen sometimes. That's you a... probably you probably saw that. Yeah, computer... Who would have thought there'd be this 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 uh, all these counterfeit games? You know. <laughs> yeah, and there is some of that, and um, yeah, never I've... burned by anything like that. I hope. I haven't personally, no. Um, actually, I did get burned once on a piece of paper. Um, <laughs> that's the only thing I know of. Um, it was, um, this isn't super interesting, but um, do I have an example here? Hang on one second. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Um, so I did get burned once that I know of, but it wasn't a game. Um, it was a flyer. Uh, this is from Japan. Um, this is a flyer for what was then a brand new console, the family computer, AKA the NES right? wow. from 1983. Um, and this is previewing the brand new games coming out. Cause at this point they'd only done three. Um, and one of these games never came out. This is a, uh, Donkey Kong music education game. They're actually doing three education games. There's Donkey Kong junior, oh. Donkey Kong junior taught math. Popeye taught English, Donkey Kong taught music. Uh, the music game never came out. And I bought this flyer from an auction site in Japan um, in order to scan these screenshots in high res so people could see what the game looked like. Um, my flyer ended up being a fake. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so I did get burned there. This is the real one. Um, someone found a real one and donated it. But, you know, 
paid a significant amount of money for a piece of paper anyway um and was burned but i've never personally been burned on games that said one of my um ways of working within this collector's community is i have a little side gig where i help to authenticate prototype game cartridges for a collectibles company um and in that process i digitize the games um and and you know try to safe keep them and hope we can get them out one day but like i can't without owner permission but point is that like i do some authentication and um I have bounced fake prototype games as part of this. Like I've done the research and been like, this is not real. It's oh. not a real game. Um, so there are people who are intentionally faking um, prototypes and submitting them um, to me and I'm too good for them. <laughs> Can you share a little bit of the strategies? For yes. <laughs> spotting a fake. I you... like talking about this. Um, <laughs> Cause I actually think I'm like inventing like an authentication methodology because I don't think anyone's doing this but me. Um, method. It's the Savaldi method. Yeah. Um, you know, what's kind of unfortunate about this whole thing is like part of my agreement with this company was I'm writing up documentation about why this may or may not be real. That documentation is public knowledge. Like that was, that was in my contract, right? It was like anything I evaluate that report is available to anyone um, because I want people to understand what it is they're buying if they buy a game through you. Um, and so I'm publishing these documents that explain why things are fake. And I might be creating super villains. <laughs> you know? Like I'm like, I, I think I have, I've put out enough documentation where you could fool me now. <laughs> you know? um, that's an unfortunate side effect, but um, okay. I don't, I don't have another example on my desk. Um, so we'll bring we'll bring uh, Beethoven back out. Um, so this is a a PCB with two ROMs on it, right? That's where the game data lives. Those are the pins that would go in your Sega Genesis. Um, I look for several things if I get something like this in. Um, first thing I look at is okay, what is this PCB, right? Um, for the most part, especially for like Nintendo stuff, we know what an authentic Nintendo prototyping PCB is. Um, and we have examples in our archives here. Um, so first thing I look for is like, okay, is this, is this, is this board real? Um, usually it is. Um, second thing I look for is on the ROMs. I don't know if that's in focus or not. Um, there we yeah, go. Yeah. Um, there is, what is it on here? Um, oh yeah. There's like, uh, 9418. Um, this chip was manufactured in the 18th week of 1994. So, um, second thing I looked for was okay, could this object have existed before this game came out or like in its time during development, right? Like, that's sort of the second thing I look for. Um, because like someone could do a fake and just pull any EEPROM off the shelf and not understand how the manufacturing dates work and might use something that's like way too new. Um, and then from there, it's usually like an investigation of the data itself. Cause I digitize the game, open it in the hex editor, kind of compare it to known ROMs, things like that. Um, the things that I've busted, there's this one person in Mexico city who just keeps making really bad fakes. And I've, I've busted like three of his, um, there was another example where someone in the industry who worked on PlayStation games, um, burned new copies of his unreleased PlayStation games and sent them in. And I was able to be like, okay, this disc was manufactured in 2008. This is not like a from development era piece of material. Nice. Um, and then the, the one that's actually really sad um, because I think people just don't tend to know. Um, so we'll bring Beethoven back out. Um so, you know, this is this is a PCB that if you were in the industry, you might have these around as you're testing games, right? You burn ROMs, you put them on here, you test your game. Um, nothing's preventing you from putting other people's games on your test PCB if you have the equipment. So there's a lot of like Super Nintendo, especially like real from Nintendo prototyping boards, but the EPROMs are populated by pirated ROMs. Um, because 
I mean, I don't, I don't know if you were on news groups back in the day. I wasn't, but like these games were being distributed over news groups in the nineties, like contemporary, you know, for people to pirate. Um, and so a lot of times developers would actually use their development equipment to play downloaded games off the internet. Huh. And then like, you know, stuff the PCB in a drawer somewhere it would end up in collector's hands and they go, oh my God, I have a prototype of Super Mario World. It's like, no, you have a pirated copy of Super Mario World on development equipment. Right. Yeah. Wow, this is fascinating. Stuff. Yeah, I really love doing that. Like, it's, it's, I love but <laughs> I, I see love what you mean, though, about not wanting to create super villains because there's probably somebody like, oh, well, my, my documentation is so <laughs> thorough that if you read it all, like, I know how to fool me. I could fool me. And they could definitely fool me. That's right. <laughs> Oh, see, Frank, time has kind of flown by. I figured it would. Do you have time for a couple more? You want to? Yeah, sure. I, I booked another fifteen. I'll look at Matt Bradley Shuri's questions here. I mean, if there's unless there's something you just want to talk about. No, I, I mean, I've, I've gone I've gone off when I felt like it. So it's your turn. Let's see. This is the one I thought was interesting. I mean, he does a good job with all his questions. So. He says as everything becomes more digital and streaming on, only. Where does that leave the future of physical media for video games? Will it be more of an elite consumer product like a laser disc? I mean, I can't predict that future, but um, I think it it is. We are in the last days of physical media being mainstream. I mean, like, I believe Best Buy has already announced that they're no longer going to carry physical media. I think next year, um, no physical media. I mean, maybe it was just games. I don't quite remember, but I think Best Buy has already made an announcement to that effect. I think Walmart is heavily rumored to be doing that as well. Um, and so I believe that the days of digital media being sold on physical media, you mm -hmm. know, being housed on physical media, like the, I think it's basically done. Um, do I think there will continue to be like, a collector's market um sure but um i don't know you think of things like limited run games right um yeah is the playstation 6 going to have physical media at all if walmart's not carrying it right i kind of doubt it um so yeah there might be still a market for small run physical releases of games at that point um but the only reason that these small runs can exist is because like Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo are already manufacturing physical media and have like a process in place for it. You know what I mean? And, and so it's not that difficult for you to place a small order at the factory, right? Um, if Walmart's no longer carrying games, then I really doubt that that process is going to be in place where one can order small runs of physical games. Mm. Um, and so I suspect that there won't be a way to satisfy even the niche collector's market. Once all the console makers have sort of shut down physical game releases. Um, so I think that's the short term future. Um, I mean, if you put a gun to my head, I'd say like in five years, it'll be like extremely weird to get, uh, uh physical games like i haven't bought one in years i mean like i just why would i you know why would i not shop from my couch um so uh, that is that scary yeah um but also frankly the data on the disc is usually not even the fully patched game <laughs> you know <laughs> like it's it's like the idea of like well how do we get at that that digital data like that's even scarier and and um so uh yeah it's unfortunate i also don't know you know like the amount of games that are purely offline off disc experiences are dwindling anyway you know like like a lot of games do rely on connectivity and, and things like that um so in the short term, I don't have high hopes for physical media. Um, long term, yeah, maybe. Um, like, I actually think that um, there's actually a pretty healthy market for new releases on old systems. 
you know, yeah. like there's, there's new stuff coming out for like the NES and the, the Genesis and like the Dreamcast and stuff like that. Too, even. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, is it a niche market? Sure. But it's also enough of a market that people actually are making their livelihoods from it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, I can see that continuing and maybe even like swinging back around. Um, I think that I'm really just rambling at this point, but like, I, I actually think that, um, people do want, people are missing the idea of like physically holding a thing. Mm. Um, and that box, the manuals, the <laughs> sure. But I don't know that that thing needs to be like media that contains game code, you yeah. know, like I, I actually suspect that, you know, I think first of all, the most like vinyl records of video game soundtracks are not listened to, right? I think people just want to buy a thing that has the game they like on it and they want to hold it and they want to open the gates fold and like look at the art and stuff like that, you know? And so I suspect that video games go that way. Um, I think that, you know, in the same way that like musicians don't make money off of their CDs or whatever. I mean, they make some off vinyl now, but um you know they they sell merch around the idea that you like the music right like like i can see there's there being a good market for tangible objects related to games you love and i, I think that market is actually really weirdly underserved um you know i i think it's weird that i can't go to like gamestop and buy like castlevania merchandise right now you know like that that's actually like money that's being left on the table in my mind um so I, I think physical, tangible things will continue to exist. Uh, but uh, no, I think in the short term, um, you know, media that that is the video game itself, like I just, I think it's inevitable that that's going away very soon. And the fact that it's all always been digital, you know, so it's just like data music. You know, there's a reason you might want a vinyl. Like I actually did get Spider-Man 2 on disc. Um, and... I actually suspect that it took longer to install from disc than it would have to have downloaded the game over my internet. <laughs> yeah. Like I actually think the transfer speed from the laser is slower than my, <laughs> than my Wi-Fi speed. Um, like, it's just like, why did I get this disc? Like, it's just, I don't want this. <laughs> Sometimes thought about people that are collecting games and maybe they're running, uh, loading a game off a tape or a disc. And I'm always thinking, you know, that disc only has so many loads on it. <laughs> is this referring to me what is this oh no yeah this was uh, some question sent in from uh, uh sent on twitter <laughs> i thought you might get a kick out of this okay i don't know if i have language uh, could never be preserved <laughs> man um we learn best from our mistakes so um so i don't i don't i definitely don't have a serious answer for this but what's my what's my like joke answer right um uh God, there's not a lot of games that I just I hate, hate. Um, I am a little bit fascinated by like the platform mascot craze of the 90s, and most of them are terrible. Um, you know, the the one game I can think of in my memory that's just like, this is so cynical that I hate it is actually Bubsy 2. Um, so let's erase Bubsy 2. Let's keep the other ones because they were trying. I don't like them. They're terrible. Bubsy and Bubsy 3D are terrible games but they were at least going for something. Bubsy 2 just feels very like cynical and like no one who worked on it seems to have like liked video games. I don't know. Bubsy 2. Let's erase Bubsy 2. Bugsy 2 will be erased permanently. I'm going to have a couple more here. Let's okay. Uh, head case. We'd love to hear if you ever cross paths with this unreleased curiosity. Bonks Racing. Let's Bonks see. Racing. Yeah. Can we click through and see that? Let's see. Oh. 1964. Oh, I remember this. Um, no, but I believe, um, I believe our paperwork collection might have like a flyer for this that might already be scanned. I'm, I'm not sure, but, um, but uh, no, but th doesn't this game have a really great art style? Like I was, I was pretty fascinated by this one too. What's that? Really looks neat. Yeah. Um, yeah, 
like a lot of unreleased games especially from this era just kind of look generic but um i actually think this one is interesting enough that it's worth putting some some uh leg work into trying to find um i've i've never looked into it and who made it or anything like that but uh yeah i think that'd be a really neat one to see yeah, it's just you know pretty much every developer I've ever had on the show. We'll we'll talk about their the games that they did and all that, but there's always a story about some game that didn't get. <laughs> Everyone's got unreleased games. Yeah, and those are always the best stories. You know, like, oh, <laughs> it sounds so much. You know, sounds so cool. <laughs> yeah, there's a big difference between ideas and the work. Unfortunately, like most of my unreleased game stories are like, well, it's mostly just an idea on paper. It's not even worth talking about. I think that about, about does it we well you did grow up in las vegas correct i did uh did you ever go to the pinball museum there that i've been to that a few times. oh yeah um i mean when i lived there it wasn't a museum yet it was just tim's house um <laughs> but yeah he used to open um so he used to be a warehouse behind his home that he put all of his machines in um and he used to it used to be called pinball fun night he'd open it up twice a year and you'd like donate to the Salvation Army at the door and 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 go in and play all the pinball you want. But uh yeah, I've I've uh yeah, I've never I don't think he'd recognize me or know my name or anything, but I've known Tim in one form or another since like 1999 or something like that. Um I used to buy bootleg VHS tapes of old cartoons from him. <laughs> um and like actually lots. a funny thing happened a few years ago. Um oh I can't remember the name of it, but I, w- I was on this torrent site of like obscure video media and someone had uploaded like recordings of a 1980s uh, local public access show where a weird guy in a Ronald Reagan mask like plays old cartoons and like does hosting between the cartoons. And it was like, it was Tim Arnold. It was uh, the, the guy who <laughs> no runs from the Hall of Fame. And I'm like, that's the guy I bought cartoons from. <laughs> it's all fitting. Like I understand the connection. They're, they're, like the, the my buying VHS bootlegs of like Bosco from the Looney Tunes from this guy. You know, he used to show those on his his public access channel in in Michigan or whatever. And now now I'm buying it from him. And then he opened a pinball museum. That's something I, I think a lot about. Just I mean, we were interested in video game history, but I've always thought that the pinball games and the electromechanical games were kind of a important predecessor yeah i've read I mean, whole of video game history that never even bring it up well i mean you know i i think there's a lot of uh criticisms to lay into the book but but um something i credit um stephen kent's book with the ultimate history of video games was tying that stuff together i think for the first time in, in like a mainstream way so I, I i agree with you and i'm appreciative of at least setting the tone with that book. That's a great book, yeah. Well, I mean, it's because it's got criticism, but you know, it's... And, and the criticism is just about like very specific, like, <laughs> well, I actually no, it's a really important book. Um, my problem with it is the same problem I have with most history books about games, especially from that era, is like it's a history of business deals and not of people making games. Yeah. Like I, I think we've done a pretty poor job of of documenting um the creative process we've done a much better job of of uh of you know documenting like business deals and 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 sales numbers and things like that but um you know we're only starting to catch up with like who actually made these and how did they make them and you know what were their ideas and what got on the cutting room floor you know um i'm just bored by video game history being the history of business i think it's more like i'm more much more interested in the art history and that's not like you know, that's just how things were back in the day. So I'm not, I'm not like throwing shade at Stephen here. I mean, like a history of painting that just focused on like the the, the sales, art. right? <laughs> like the people who bought them, you yeah. know, like, like it's like focused on the rich people who commissioned them or whatever. Exactly. Well, thanks a lot, Frank, for taking so much time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm man. Happy on. to. And we can have you back on some point, I hope. Sure. Yeah. I th- yeah, I mean, I, I kind of remember you sending a pretty big outline. We probably up around the museum or anything, or the... yeah, um, promote some stuff. Yeah, uh, I haven't completely solidified this yet, but we're we're planning on. Well, first of all, Giving Tuesday is uh, November twenty eighth. That is when nonprofits like ours um, ask you for money. <laughs> but essentially, that's kind of like 
the season that a lot of nonprofits like ours um, really put ourselves out of there and, 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 and try to fundraise for next year. Um, and um, so we will be doing that on gamehistory.org, but um, we're, we're planning a lot of cool stuff um, throughout the month of December. Um, I, I mean, I'll just say here, but it's not completely solidified yet, but we're, we're planning on like putting out some cool piece of content pretty much every day in December, just to keep people excited about video game history. So um, go sign up for our mailing list um, on, on the homepage, gamehistory.org. Yeah. You know, go to our merch shop. Sure. As we're seeing here, uh, actually my favorite thing is that first thing here. We, we sell old video game magazines, blind box style. History box. Oh, yeah. Great idea. So we, you know, we, we are a library of video game magazines, among other things, and we have a lot of duplicates and we have so many duplicates that I will let you subscribe to our duplicates. You can get a new old magazine every month. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. We actually have, um, I don't know. We have like over 400 subscribers right now that we're sending out magazines to every month. This is like, I really like this program because it like, it's you get something for your money. You're not just giving us money, you know, out of the goodness of your hearts. I do have to upcharge for eighties and nineties, um, as you just saw. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is a way that you get something for your donation essentially. And, and, um, the money has gone directly into magazine preservation. And we've actually scanned, I think 1200 magazines that weren't on the internet before um, because of this program. So it's, it's a really, really cool way of directly affecting preservation. This is a great idea. Thank you. Check out that third picture. There's a certificate. Yeah. I was looking at that one. Yeah, you get a certificate signed by me. Yeah. <laughs> I have them right here. Actually I put them on camera. You know, it's not a counterfeit. <laughs> Cause I, I tend to sign these when I'm doing uh, audio only podcasts. So, but yeah, anything else matter? Should we wrap it up? I think that's you'd mentioned the was there something else on the website we need to show? Or? Oh, just um sign up for the mailing list if you want to like get uh, in on the the cool uh, December we're about to have. I don't know when the show comes out, but um starting November 28th we're going to start um putting some cool stuff in your this cool stuff in your inbox every day if you sign up. So so go sign up and and uh well, that's really and, cool. I'm pretty sure a lot of my listeners and viewers or chatters or whatever <laughs> you got yeah. an audience <laughs> go sign up for the mailing list donate sign up for the mailing list if you want to hang out with us uh magazines. You know, that's a great deal yeah and then uh we do have a patreon if you want to hang out on our discord with a bunch of cool game historians you know what i love about those old magazines or the ads oh yeah a ton of them <laughs> it's, a, it's such a hoot <laughs> yeah all right, all right well, matt thanks well again. uh yeah do i need to stick around while we wrap up or no we'll just we'll just stop it Okay, cool. Uh, thank you so much for your interest, for having me on. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, till next time, we'll do this again for sure. And Pua! that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. That was, I had so much fun uh, chatting with Frank. I'll have him back on uh, later. You know, there's always so much more stuff uh, that we could have covered that we just simply ran out of time to do. Uh, got a lot of great uh, people coming on the show as well. Going to be talking to another uh, professor soon, except a professor specializing in video games. <laughs> hey, maybe I should get into that gig. That sounds pretty sweet. Uh, but anyway, stay tuned for that. A lot of great stuff coming up. And as always, especially with Thanksgiving right around the corner, I want to express to you my thanks, my gratitude. You know, people, you can say a lot of things about me, but you can never say I'm not thankful. I am nothing but thanks. I am full gratitude. I am gratitudinous to the extreme gratitude <laughs> uh, to you for keeping this show on the air. My patrons, my retrons, as I prefer to call you. Uh, if you are supporting the show, thank you. If you are watching the show, enjoying the show, and thinking about whether it would be worth that time and trouble to click on that little link and go to the Patreon site and clicky, clicky. It takes about five seconds and it's only one dollar. <laughs> uh, please uh, put off the procrastination. Go over there. You know you want to do it. It's so much fun. You're going to like this show. If you like the show, a five is going to bounce it up to a ten. Don't know how it works. It is magical because you are uh, showing your thanks <laughs> supporting the show you're part of the team you're part of the uh, discord channel 
It's fantastic fun. I know you're going to like it. So don't don't uh, don't wait anymore. Get over there. You know. Uh, uh. <laughs> Can you see this? Fashion mullet. <laughs> it's cracking me up. I could barely do this bit. Uh, I kept thinking about this thing back here. I mean, this is probably the funniest, uh, some of the funniest packaging I've ever seen on beer. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, I think I'll probably see if I can save this box. Is it? Uh, it's a right. Kind of looks like the uh, them uh, guy. Who's I'm blanking on the name of that guy? Business in the front, party in the rear. <laughs> Fashion mullet. <laughs> anyway, I saw this on the shelf, and I'm like, man, I've got to get this. <laughs> it's just too hilarious not to purchase it. Uh, Lapulin Brewing. Let's see, microbrewery and tap room um we've got a lot of write up here east west hazy india pale ale business in the front party in the rear you know i've never actually rocked a mullet uh, you know i like it <laughs> i thought about it <laughs> i know they're kind of uh, uh not the most fashionable thing kind of like a fanny pack but i'm like what the heck why not buck the trend go for it uh let's see this hip bomb this hop bomb is one part East Coast Haze Bro and one part Old School West Coast. Don't pick a side in this fight, you won't win. Malts, Pale Ale, Crapulous, Crapulous? Carapils, maybe? Carapils? <laughs> uh, honey Malt, Columbus. Oh, here's the hops. Well, so three different kinds of malts, and then they've got uh, one, two, three, four different hops. And one Citra, Simcoe, man, my vision is not getting any better. <laughs> Columbus, Falconer, Falconer's Flight? There's a hops out there called Falconer's Flight. That sounds kind of interesting. Uh, anyway, let's see. Does it say where these guys are from? Where are they from? Lupulin Brewing. Yeah, more on the back. Oh, cool. They're from Big Lake, Minnesota. <laughs> so not very far from me at all. Uh, we created Lupulin Brewing to bring people together to build a better community, a new and innovative kind of workplace to define those attempts, to define who we are and buy paths of life, blah, blah, blah. Raise your glass and come join us in our cause. Work sucks. Drink beer. Apparently is their motto. <laughs> anyway, let's open this sucker up. It's, it's uh, almost a shame to open this, but uh, let's go ahead and see if I can figure out how, how to open it. Look, like there's kind of a sign opening. I really don't want to damage this cool box. I, may, I might have to, though. Looks like it might sort of tear along the side here. Oh, what the hell, I can always buy another box. Maybe I can buy a box for collector's purposes. Okay, let's get the can out. <laughs> you know, if you're walking around with this can, you know, you get some attention. Fashion mullet. Yeah, it's perfect. Oh, cool. Check. <laughs> Sarah's going along the side of the can. <laughs> oh, this is so cool. Man, I love a mullet. What? Huh. Trying to figure this guy out. Okay. <laughs> well, if the if the beer is even halfway as creative as this uh, can is, we're in for a real treat. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and rate the packaging on this thing a perfect uh, 10 out of 10. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen such a creative uh, can design and box design. Uh, you know, certainly does some pretty fun stuff, but you know, I think these these guys might. Uh... <laughs> I love it. <laughs> anyway, let's get into the drinking horn. Holy cow! Fashion mullet. I'm a little bit stopped up today, so I don't know if I'm going to be woo, operating at 100%. You know, it's important to have the nostrils clear when you're trying to sample a beer, because a lot of it is the smell. Ah, it smells really good. Ah, really hoppy. You know, not surprised considering they have four different hops in there. Man, I am spilling this everywhere. Pour a little bit here in the horn, get some into a glass so we can look at the color. All right. Yeah, it still smells really hoppy. Yeah, that's what I'm smelling. I think it has some citra in there. Definitely have a citrusy aroma to it. Um, yeah, I don't know, again, who would smell this and not want to drink it? I think I would give the, uh, the aroma. You know, it's nice and hoppy. It's not overpowering. I might go like 8 out of 10 on that. You know, it's... I'm trying to quantify everything. <laughs> I'll see how long that continues. Anyway, let's give it a taste here. Ah, almost very fruity, actually. 
A little bit bitter. Uh, what is that? Kind of a peachy taste, you know, I would say. A little bit of apricot. Yeah, a little bit of uh, fruit. Of course, you taste the hops. Uh, a little bit of bitterness, not overpowering. Uh, smooth, uh, refreshing. Uh, I like the uh, creaminess of it. Mm. Yeah, that's tight. <laughs> that's uh, really good. Uh, <clears throat> Why do they call this a hazy uh, IPA or West East IPA, something like that? Yeah, I'm really digging this. It's not a, you know, it's not so powerful or potent that you're kind of like, whoa, better sip this, you know. <laughs> it's a, this tastes good. It's just the right amount of bitterness. Kind of balance out the sweetness of some of those fruit. Now, I wouldn't want it to be too fruity. You know, I'm not drinking fruit juice here. <laughs> here, have a look at the color there. Oh, nice head on this. Good bubbly action. Yeah, really active. You know, as I started brewing my own beer, well, you realize there's an art uh, to getting just the kind of right carbonation so you get really good bubbles. <laughs> you know, it doesn't sound like it'd be that important, but uh, having the right kind of carbonation really adds a lot uh, to the experience. I think they call it the mouthfeel. <laughs> uh, you know, so I'd give this one a, you know, I'd give this a very solid uh, 8, 9 out of 10 on that. It's just really tasty. Uh, really fruity, citrusy, uh, just a little bit of bitterness. Uh, so th certainly nothing that would challenge you if you don't like uh, real hoppy flavors. I think they did a really good job balancing this out. And man, that can is ex extraordinary. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I'd go probably uh, somewhere between four and a five. Let's call it a 4.5 uh, on this. Uh, really fun. I definitely would drink this again. Uh, I think you'd have a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm pulling that out <laughs> uh, with your friends. But uh, anyway, there's the L segment. I got a little excited because you know what I forgot to do? The news for the Matt Cave. from the mat cave. I have to hurry up and do this before the uh, fashion mullet kicks in. <laughs> it might make it more fun. <laughs> All right, Miko Selva writes in about Colony Ship. This is a turn-based, party-based role-playing game set aboard a generation ship. Not next generation, but generation seed ship kind of story, I'm assuming. Uh, launched to Proxima Centauri. The game features a detailed skill-based character system, multiple ways to handle quests, choices and consequences, and branching dialogue. Trees. This is from Iron Tower Studio. Age of Decadence and Dungeon Rats. Really good crew. It looks like a really good game. Uh, kind of looks a little bit like Under... What's it? Under Rail? Is that the name of that, that game? But uh, anyway, check that one out. Let me know what you think. Uh, and then Tired Gaming Dad. Uh, yes, TGD, as we like to call it. Uh, writes in about Keeper FX 1.0. Uh, so this is a... And they taken the original Dungeon Keeper code, rewrote it, did a bunch of fixes, improvements, new units. Uh, so what we end up with is an open source fan remake and expansion of Dungeon Keeper. Now our main goal is to preserve and expand upon the original DK experience, offering many new features while staying true to the original feeling of the game. Uh, so I was saying on Discord, I love this kind of stuff by fans, for fans. You know, how can you go wrong with this? So definitely check out Keeper FX 1.0, just released. And then Matt Workalo, we can't leave Matt out. <laughs> no way, we would never do that, no. Uh, he wrote in, I got a couple things, but I, I noticed a game he posted about called Rogue Craft, all one word, Rogue Craft. A modern turn-based roguelike focused on simplicity and fun. Unlike those other roguelikes that are <laughs> based on complexity and not fun. Uh, I don't know about that. I, I like the, the comp isn't that the, complex the complexity part of what makes them fun? Uh, but anyway, moving on, it is a dungeon crawler uh, where each playthrough is a unique experience. As you progress in the game, you will combat meaner monsters and tougher challenges. You only have one life, so you have to be careful. But if you reach the end, there are wonderful rewards. Now, the cool thing about Roguecraft is that it's currently under development for the Commodore Amiga. Yes, people are still doing great stuff on my favorite all-time platform. 
with other platforms to follow. But do you really need other platforms? <laughs> you got the, uh, the Amiga represented, hell yeah. Uh, so anyway, thank you, Matt, for that. Uh, so I got a little mixed up, did the L segment before the news, so we'll still wrap it up, though, uh, with a quote here at the end. And I was uh, over on Brainy Quotes, and before I even started looking for a quote, uh, I looked at the one, the, the quote of the day. And it really caught my eye, seemed appropriate. And so I just thought I'd go with that. It's by Arthur Helps, a British historian. So it kind of ties in with our history theme here. Anyway, it goes something like this. Wise sayings often fall on barren ground, but a kind word is never thrown away. So ponder on that, be kind, and see you next time. Robo, any special message for all the kids watching at home? Wow. Stay out of trouble.